Here is the molecule of naphthalene, which you might know as the mothball stuff. And while naphthalene itself is a white powder, they often add some pink or purple or maybe lavender coloring agents to it to make sure that your grandma fences it a bit more. Fun fact! Naphthalene-based mothballs are pretty much useless, although I suspect that the true reason for their abundance in the grandma's attic is to keep the grandchildren away, but I digress. The reason why I'm looking at naphthalene today is because it has a rather interesting reactivity when it comes to the electrophilic aromatic substitution reactions. Let's take, for instance, a nitration reaction. Naphthalene is a very symmetrical molecule with two planes of symmetry. So we have two possible places where the nitration can occur. Traditionally, we refer to those as alpha and beta positions. But if you prefer the IOPAC nomenclature, those would be one and two positions correspondingly. Now, if the reaction occurred in a purely statistical fashion, we should expect to see both products in a roughly 50-50 ratio. Maybe one could make an argument that due to the steric hindrances that you would see over here in the alpha position, the beta product should probably the major or maybe at least more dominant product on this reaction. And yet, when we do this reaction in the lab, we see that the alpha nitronaphthalene is the major product. The actual ratio varies based on how exactly the reaction is performed, but it is roughly 90% of the alpha product and about 10% of the beta product. So steric hindrance here is certainly not a factor. Well, bummer. Well, what is then? How can we explain such a prominent regioselectivity? I suppose the answer is hiding somewhere in the mechanism of this reaction. So let's take a closer look. Nitration is a typical electrophilic aromatic substitution reaction. And the first step in this reaction is always going to be the formation of the electrophile. In this case, we are going to make our NO2 electrophile over here by first protonating the nitric acid with sulfuric acid, which is a stronger acid, giving us a positively charged intermediate with two pluses, and then upon leaving group dissociation, the water is going to pop off and give us our electrophile NO2+. Now, once we have the electrophile in the system, it can now attack the aromatic ring, making a corresponding resonance stabilized carbocation. And since we have two possible positions for the attack, I'm going to show both intermediates here. So this is going to be my intermediate for the alpha attack, and this one is going to be the intermediate for the attack of the beta position. Now, the fun part here, like in any electrophilic aromatic substitution reaction, is of course the resonance. And of course, the bigger the molecule, the more of those resonance structures we are going to have for it. And by the way, aromatic chemistry is pretty much all about resonance. So if you feel a little rusty on this subject, it might be your call to do some review now. I'll leave all the links to the uh, bonding and resonance videos that I have in the description below as well for easy navigation. Anyways, back to my resonance here. I'm not going to waste your time drawing each structure one by one, so let's just skip ahead and here we go. Each carbocation intermediate here has five resonance structures, including the initial structure, of course. Whenever you are counting your resonance structures or drawing your resonance structures for any kind of a molecule, always remember that the initial structure where you started your resonance is also counted as a resonance structure. The superficial analysis here will also show that we don't have any significant differences between those structures either. But we know from the experimental evidence that the first carbocation that we have over here with all of those resonance structures must be more stable as it yields the major product at a staggering 9 to 10 ratio. So there got to be a difference. And there is one. If we pay very close attention to the resonance structures, we can see that the first set has two structures with an intact aromatic ring, while the second set only has one such structure. That difference is what explains why the first carbocation is so much more stable than the second one. Often we are used to thinking that in the case of the resonance structures of carbocations, the only difference that matters is the position of the carbocation, but that's a very superficial approach to the resonance contributors. When it comes to the aromatic compounds, the intact aromatic moieties affect the overall stability way more than the position of the carbocation. 
And we can clearly see it here with the experimental evidence. So to wrap up the mechanism, we just need to eliminate the proton from the same position uh, where we have attached our nitro group and we're done. So the resonance shenanigans are going to be quite a big deal in polycyclic aromatic compounds, like for instance naphthalene, or maybe if you see anthracene, phenantran, and many other ones. So when in doubt, draw your resonance structures and analyze them very carefully. Remember that intact aromatic rings are the king here. If you want to see another example where this comes at play, check out my video on the naphthol acidity, where we analyze the reasons why the alpha naphthol is more acidic than the beta naphthol. In the meantime, hit the like button if you learned something new today, leave me your feedback and suggestions in the comments below, subscribe for daily organic chemistry updates, watch this video next, and I will see you tomorrow!